out here. We're really out here in the middle of the wilderness. It's beautiful, but it's like the middle of nowhere. I guess this is a good place to have an animal sanctuary because then you have a lot of room and you're not gonna bother any neighbors. I'm like weirdly nervous. What if they don't like me? Okay, so I love foxes, and not in a weird, creepy, fetish way. Although I do just have to say that I think the 1973 Disney animated version of Robin Hood with the foxes probably changed us all forever in ways we're not willing to admit. I owe my life to you, my darling. I couldn't have lived without you, Robin. No, but really, I've always been drawn to their cunning and their playfulness, and I think their similarity to dogs. They're so similar and yet so far away from that familiar companion animal that we all know and love. And I think that eerie wildness is really captivating because it's almost something we could have, but not quite. So what is it exactly that makes domesticated animals like dogs so different from a wild animal like a fox? And could we ever have domesticated foxes? As we've established, foxes are what we would consider a wild animal. This means they live out in nature by their own wits and they don't need humans to look after their well-being. And in turn, we humans haven't changed them in any significant way for our own benefit, like we have with sheep or dogs or cows or any other domesticated animal that you could name. But some people are actually looking to potentially change that. Today's the day! Today's the day! We're going to do the most exciting thing I may have ever done in my entire life, <laughs> which is um, see foxes. Not just these two. Hey, not just these two. Thanks, guys. Good, good content. <laughs> We're here! Canid education! We're about to get educated by some canids. <laughs> How do you feel? I feel overwhelmed. <laughs> I'm really excited. So he's obviously the color that you would expect to see a red fox in the wild. Sure. So there's only two colors. They only really come in two colors in the wild: red and silver. So she's in a, she's domesticated like these guys are. Well, no, she's a U.S. fox, so she's what you would call tame. Oh, so she okay. was socialized way better than these guys were. So she was pulled from her mother at ten days age, bottle fed by people. She was around people all the time, so she was she got out a lot more than well, me. It sounds like. yeah, right. <laughs> the problem with a lot of wild animals or more wild animals is they, you know, they're 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 great when they're young. They like people. They hang out with people. But as soon as they go into like sexual maturity, their instincts seem to kind of come through a lot more, and they become more wild, if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, so while she's very used to people, she still can go to the wild side. With well, these guys, you upset them, they, they just flash you dirty looks and walk away. And, um, well, she'll she'll bite first, usually. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yes, you will, Ichi. <laughs> yeah. And that's the problem with, you know, we don't advocate foxes as pets for that reason. I mean, for certain people, I mean, there's certain situations where it works out great for the fox and the person. But people get one, you know, four or five weeks old. They don't really know much about it. They assume it's going to be like a cat or a dog. And it's fine for the first several months, and then they get into this this area where they're starting to get into sexual maturity. And you know, you see on the fox forums, you see when people get them around this time of year, oh, this is wonderful, da da da. And then about six months from now, you see these fox forums posting all these foxes are being rehomed, mm. or my fox is, you know, got a, got away. I don't know where it went. Meaning they just threw it out the door. Usually, mm. my fox was poisoned. All this kind of stuff going on. And it's just because people don't really understand what they're going to get. Going. Fox enthusiasts misguidingly adopting fox kits and then freaking out when the fox turns out to surprise be a wild animal are not humanity's first foray into domesticating foxes because there is an experiment. It was started in 1959 and is still alive and well today. And it was begun by a Russian zoologist named Dmitry Belyaev. 
He wanted to know exactly how our ancestors domesticated dogs from wild wolves. And to dig into that, he hypothesized that foxes could be domesticated in a similar way. And he hoped to recreate this process and kind of speed it up by virtue of having many successive generations of lab animals to work with, as opposed to thousands of years of trial and error with animals in the wild, the way we think our ancestors probably did it with wolves. He and his team selected for traits they associated with domestication, friendly toward humans, eager to establish contact with humans, communicating with humans by whimpering and sniffing and licking to attract attention, with the idea that these were similar to traits that humans probably accidentally selected for when making friends with wolves way back when. And after many successive generations of lab-raised foxes, in some sense, it worked. These foxes are not afraid of humans and will definitely come to you for food and are generally pretty chill. They're definitely not wild foxes, but they're also really not an animal you would want to have as a pet. See, the domesticated fox is still the same species as the wild fox. Vulpus vulpus. But it is genetically different. They're trying to find genetic basis of domestication. Where, what genes have changed in these foxes to make them like they are? And um, they've found a whole host of genes that have changed. And the Russian foxes, they, they, they're, I always call them the hippie foxes because they're just they're really laid back. I mean, foxes are usually very high strung animals because, I mean, in the wild, they're not apex predators. Things eat them out there, and, and certainly people aren't so nice to them. And, um, but when they bred these animals for tameness, what they did is they just made them very calm. Um, they, when they looked at their um, brain chemistry, they found they actually have more serotonin in their brains, which is the chemical if you take like Prozac, these kind of things right. you get in your brain. Like so they're, yeah, so they're just kind of really happy. It's like, you know, most foxes you go and you take, they try to take a food bowl away and they'll just freak out about it and bite you. These guys, you take their food and they just might give you a dirty look, but they're like, <laughs> why'd you do that? Yeah, so, okay, you'll give me more. I, <laughs> I know you're going to give me more. It's not a big deal. And they do have lower levels of cortisol as well, they found. Less so stress. Less stress. Um, which also, um, their urine actually smells a little bit less than the U.S. foxes. Um, it's not like it's pleasant, but it does have a little less odor. As Balayev and his research team bred their tame foxes and selected for those desirable behavioral traits, they were also selecting for certain genes. And while those genes may have been related in some way to desirable behaviors in ways we're not really able to exactly pinpoint yet, the artificial selection was also, sort of as a byproduct, selecting for certain physical characteristics. And this phenomenon is known as domestication syndrome. Domestication syndrome manifests itself with familiar physical traits like floppier ears and shorter, less pointy snouts, more juvenile looking faces, smaller jaws, things like that. It's still being studied today, but it was actually first noted by Charles Darwin more than 140 years ago. While the Russia experiment is still ongoing and producing domesticated foxes has been what we could call successful, we're nowhere near the point with foxes that we've gotten to with dogs. And this may come down to the difference in their brains. Foxes are not pack animals in the way that almost every other canid is, like wolves and jackals and dogs. They're social and playful, yes, but they mostly form groups with their families until their babies are grown up, and then they all just fly solo. And scientists think that this difference may mean that foxes have less of some neurotransmitters and the corresponding neurotransmitter receptors. We're talking brain chemicals like oxytocin that promote pack bonding and forms strong bonds between organisms. It's what's released in our brains when we look at and hold our children. It's a very strong part of social glue. But that means that foxes, who may have less of it, don't look at you and see alpha dog pack leader, I'm gonna come when you call regardless of whether or not you have food, sort of that inherent love and loyalty that we may get from a dog. And instead, foxes look at you and see human. Does human have food? I might come, but I am under no other kind of obligation to be interested in you. The fox breeding scientists only just sequenced the fox genome last year in 2018. They sequenced and compared the genomes of three groups of foxes, tame, aggressive, and normal. And there are some interesting relationships between the genes that researchers have identified as being associated with domestication and genes in humans that are associated with some social bonding disorders. 
but in my opinion, it's too soon to make any direct conclusions from the genetic side of it yet. We're still parsing through what it all means. But I think if nothing else, it will definitely continue to help us piece together more of the puzzle in understanding how and why domestication of wild animals happens, and maybe could in the future give us some insight into human behavior as well. And it's not just that. Domesticating animals like foxes could prove super useful to fields like search and rescue. Our original thoughts is with foxes, in order to try to put them in a better light, is to teach them to do search and rescue. Hmm. Um, because they have this behavior, well, they also have this behavior where you've probably seen it on the internet where they'll walk on top of the snow and they'll, your ears are going and they'll hear a rodent three feet under the snow and they'll stop and they'll jump up in the air, spin around, go down, right. come up with a mouse in it. And I'm assuming, you know, someone under the snow and an avalanche will be moving, so they're attuned to hearing those sort of sounds. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think physiologically they could certainly do that. Um, the issue we had with them is because you can't get them from Russia until they're at least six months of age, there's no way to start teaching them that stuff really young. And, and you know, foxes, while they've, they've domesticated them to the extent that they're very chill and very, um, um, you know, not aggressive, they're still foxes, so the chance of, you know, letting a fox loose on a mountainside and having it actually come back to you <laughs> yeah. is probably next to zero. So circling back around, what do you then do with a domesticated fox once you've created it for research purposes? Well, they're for sale. To places like the Judith A. Bassett Canid Education and Conservation Center, which is where we went to see and meet these foxes. They're keeping the domesticated foxes as species ambassadors, so that people can come and learn more about canids of all kinds. It's important to remember that these foxes, which are now domesticated, probably wouldn't fare well in the wild because they've lost those traits that make them good at being wild. So they can't be released, but they're also not that great at being pets. They can't exactly be potty trained and they dig holes under the fence and they're not great rule learners or abiders. So it's a bit of a tough, messy situation if you want one in your house but they are the perfect candidate to be a fox celebrity for a meet and greet so that people can come and visit and learn more about canid behavior and conservation. Because foxes aren't the only canids at the center. They also take in what are called primitive dogs, like the New Guinea singing dog, for example. People know that the, the dog evolved from the wolf. <laughs> But the wolf that you people think of is probably not the wolf that dogs because actually it evolved so from. Long ago and and it's it's, it's probably a, a, actually yeah. an extinct wolf that they evolved from. That could be the common ancestor of the extinct wolves now, right. and, and the dogs. dogs. Yeah, that makes sense. And it was probably a bit smaller than wolves are, than the northern wolves are now. Sure. More like dingo kind of size. Um, sure, sure, sure. Primitive dogs is kind of an ambiguous term. It's not very well defined in the animal sciences community, but a common interpretation is kind of like one step removed or the in-between link between wild dogs and domesticated dogs, like your African painted wild dog and fully domesticated dogs, like your poodle sitting at home. There are also some fully domesticated dogs that are referred to as primitive, and it's actually a pretty long list with mastiffs and spitzes and shiba inus, supposedly because they're closer to their ancient, more originally domesticated relatives than some other breeds are, like, you know, the Pomeranian, for example. But dogs like the New Guinea singing dog are in this weird in-between space where they're hard to train and care for, like foxes, because they're partially domesticated, but they're not fully wild, and some people do try to keep them as pets. But like with foxes, you really need to know your stuff and you need to know what you're getting into if you're gonna take that on. So the center hopes that by having all kinds of canids available as ambassadors, they'll be able to help raise awareness not only for really knowing what you're getting into if you're gonna take on a pet like this so we don't end up with unwanted animals with nowhere to go, but also awareness and support for canid conservation all over the world, where whole species of rare dogs like the New Guinea singing dog that could 
hold the secrets to domestication because they're the missing link are at risk of being lost forever because of habitat encroachment and interference by humans. I think the center does amazing work and it was the trip of a lifetime to be able to go down and meet their ambassador foxes and they're ramping up funding for their new education and conservation space that they're hoping to build out. So if you can go over and donate to them and support that mission, that would be amazing. I'm gonna leave that link down in the description. I went on this road trip with two incredible friends of mine back at the end of winter when my partner was still in the hospital with cancer. And it was the only time I left town while he was hospitalized and my sister hugely helped out to make it possible for me to go by coming and staying with him in my absence in the middle of what was just a really, really time. So I just had to say thank you at the end of this video to my amazing support network, Madeline, Charlie, and Ariel, because without them, I would never have gotten to live out my dream of being so close to real live foxes, getting to meet them and interact with them and learn so much and just have a really, really, really lovely time. So thank you so much for keeping me healthy and sane. And thank you also to my patrons listed here on one of these sides, I don't know where I'm gonna put it yet, who also made this video possible. Please consider becoming a patron on my Patreon so that you can support this channel, me, making even more videos like this about amazing science stuff. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next week, hopefully, for more everyday science. <laughs>